Ding dong, learning's back. Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. In the next few minutes, we're gonna take a look at one of the most exciting and contested elections in American history, the election of 1800. So let's take a look at the candidates. Let's take a look at the issues, the winner, and some of the big ideas that transcend that election and really affect American history throughout its course. So giddy up, let's go. Let the learning begin. Let the fighting begin. Uh, the election of 1800, sometimes referred to as the Revolution of 1800, um, and that's the first big idea. It's called a revolution because for the first time in American history, we have a peaceful transfer of power. We have an outgoing Federalist Party, and we're going to have the incoming Democratic Republican Party, and it's bloodless. And in many European countries, when you would have an election and the other side would win, the other gang would win, um, there would be blood, you know, spilling on the streets. But we call it the Revolution of 1800 because it's a transfer, a peaceful transfer of power. But on one side, we have the Federalists. The Federalists are generally seen as um, kind of the northern faction of the country. Um, John Adams and his choice was actually a southerner from South Carolina, George Pickney. And what they basically believe in, and you know, Washington was a Federalist and Adams is a Federalist, they believe in strong centralized power. Um, they're much more pro-British. They were in favor of kind of uh, uh, trade deals with England, and uh, they're not big fans of the French. The French Revolution scares the hell out of them, and um, they, we almost had a quasi-war with the French over the XYZ affair. Um, they're also for uh, higher tariffs, which protect northern manufacturers, and they also are responsible for the Alien and Sedition Act, which was a huge law that was passed under Adams that was seen by civil libertarians, especially in the South of the Southern governments, as a violation of the Constitution not only in terms of free speech with the uh, kind of the sedition part, but in an immigration kind of way. And it kind of pissed off, you know, a lot of immigration, uh, immigrants and um, immigration advocates because it sought to clamp down, I think for political reasons, against the Republican Party, the Democratic Republican Party. And I believe in New York, there was only one Democratic Republican pro newspaper left because of the fear of being, you know, sanctionalized or arrested for speech against the Federalist government. But yep, yep, yep. On the other side, we have Thomas Jefferson of uh, Virginia, and we have Aaron Burr of New York, and these are the Democratic Republicans, and sometimes they'll be called Republicans, but I like to reserve that for Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party. But this Democratic Republican Party is more kind of representative of the Southern interest. Uh, they're against tariffs. They're against the National Bank. They see the Alien Sedition Act as, you know, kind of like a... Uh, you, know, you know, tyranny, what they expected from a centralized government. So they're for decentralized power. Um, they're also much more likely to, to support the, um, the, the French. Um, they're not saying they're all pro-French revolution, but um, they're definitely kind of that more radicalized element or anti-governmental element of the country. So this is a repeat of 1796. I don't know if I said that before, and um, they run again. So let's take a look at the results now, all right? We basically know we have a northern interest federalist side, and we have the Democratic Republican Party kind of by, you know, represented by Jefferson and Burr um, that are trying to win. So there's another player in this that we haven't mentioned because you'd think that would be enough to have Federalists running against Democratic Republicans. Um, but the Federalist Party has a problem and his name is Alex. And I don't mean Alex Trebek. I'm talking about Alexander Hamilton. Um, Alexander Hamilton and sometimes uh, his group of allies were called the High Federalists uh, because they are uh, much more in a, uh, what do you want to call it, um, an ideological camp when it comes to Federalist ideas. Like we were talking about before, centralized power, and I didn't mention sales tax, but raising money for standing armies, and you know, really using the force of the government, not only economically, but through foreign policy to get what they wanted. And he doesn't dig John Adams. He sees John Adams as a little wishy-washy, as uh, maybe maybe it's a personal thing. I think that you know Hamilton had a lot of influence in the Washington administration before the affair, um, but nevertheless he doesn't feel as though he's going to have you know his uh, marbles being counted with John Adams. So he actually starts to um, write oh, he writes a letter. He releases a, a series of letters um, that are trying to convince people to to vote against John Adams and actually to throw their support in the Electoral College for um, um, Pickney, who was supposed to be the vice president. So this causes kind of a rift in the Federalist Party, and I think it backfires. I mean, not only is it going to cost the Federalist Party votes, but it also backlashes on Hamilton, and I think even kind of uh, hastens his, his, uh, his demise in the political world. We'll see in a few years later that Aaron Burr, who um, you're going you're gonna to see Hamilton um, go after in a moment again, um, is going to actually shoot Hamilton. Aaron Burr shot Hamilton. <laughs> 
So let's take a look at the results, and I think it's really important that we take a moment to explain a big difference back then in the Electoral College, namely the Twelfth Amendment. Um, the, t today we understand that when you vote, um, you vote for a ticket, you vote for president and vice president, and I'm not going to re-explain the Electoral College, but the electors in each state also today vote for a ticket. They put their support behind um, Obama-Biden, Obama or they put their support behind Romney-Paul. Um, uh, um, but back then, before the Twelfth Amendment, you actually cast two ballots as an elector. So you'd go in and you would vote for Obama and Biden. And the way that it worked is when they counted the electoral votes at the end of the day in the Electoral College, um, whoever had the most votes was president, and the most second vote, the second you know, most votes was vice president. So the plan all along, they figured out how to gerrymander this system, was that you would have your electors cast their votes both for you know, the president and vice president, and then you'd have one dude one elector who would vote for a different vice president. So instead of voting for um, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, they would vote for Thomas Jefferson and uh, Luke Skywalker. And then when you counted the votes, if you won the Electoral College, it would be Jefferson and Burr. Fail! They messed it up. They messed it up. The Federalists didn't. The Federalists, you know, one of their electors voted for John Jay, I believe. You know, in anticipation if they won that you know, it would be, um, you know, Adams and Pickney. They messed it up! The Democratic Republicans messed it up! So at the end of the day, we end up with 73 electoral votes and a tie between um, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. So what happens in electoral tie, guys? You remember this. It goes to the House of Representatives. Well, that's great news, right? Because the Democratic Republicans had a banner year. They, you know, won the House of Representatives, so they're all on the same page. They'll pick Jefferson, they'll call it a day, they'll go home and take a nap. Fail! The way the Constitution works, it's the sitting Congress, the sitting House of Representatives. So that's a pro-Federalist Party House of Representatives. Brr, what to do? Yeah! So they, they want to screw Jefferson. They don't want Jefferson, their nemesis, you know, their number one enemy to be the president of the United States. So they start casting their ballot. And each time we find out that we can't get a winner, that Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson are not getting the needed majority to be the winner. So they cast a second ballot. Then the House of Representatives has to do a third and a fifth and a tenth. They went through 35 ballots, guys. 35 ballots before Enter Alex comes back in and Hamilton convinces some of his allies in the Congress, some of the other Federalists, to support Thomas Jefferson, the nemesis. Because he believed that Aaron Burr um, was untrustworthy, that Aaron Burr didn't have character, and that even though he disagreed with Jefferson on all of these finer points on foreign policy and taxes and tariffs and centralized power, that he could be trusted. So, on the 36th ballot, we get President Thomas Jefferson. How do you like that? So, in terms of big ideas, we have a few big ones, right? Let's just review really quick. First of all, it's called the Revolution of 1800. And we understand that, that, that that's party change. The peaceful party change is the reason why we call it the, the revolution. Number two, we really see a cementing of factions in this electoral map. That we're really going to have a Democratic Republican Party that is, you know, kind of a southern rooted party. And although the Federalists aren't going to be around forever, that faction of nor the, the Northeast is going to be a pro-business manufacturing, centralized power. Later it'll transfer to the Whigs and then down the road to the Republican Party and um, it'll, it'll change. But nevertheless, I think kind of the realignment of the map or the alignment of the map is something that's really important. Um, and also the Twelfth Amendment. The Twelfth Amendment is going to correct that constitutional boo-boo. Who called these guys geniuses? I mean, what are you talking about? Really? The second guy placed could become... That's ridiculous. So the Twelfth Amendment is going to change that, and now we're not going to have that problem anymore. Although it's also important, the last thing to say is that this shows you that the Electoral College is truly an indirect example of democracy, indirect democracy, right? Who chose the president? It wasn't the people directly. It was through the House of Representatives. So remember, that can still happen. If you have more than one, two political parties running for the, in the Electoral College, if you split that bad boy up, it would be the sitting House of Representatives that would choose the president.
president. So if we had an electoral tie today, right, 269 to 269, it would be President Romney because it would be the sitting House Republicans uh, in the House of Representatives that would choose the president. So we hope that you learned something, you know, that 1800, I mean, gosh, you know, it ends up a guy gets shot. You know, there's an affair, there's dirty letter writing, there's, you know, uh, claims of you're not an American. Uh, my God. It hasn't changed, has it? So ding dong, guys, learning is done. So there we go, guys. Make sure if you haven't already that you subscribe to Hip Hughes right now. Click Gnome, click the Gnome Chomsky, and he will take you to the land of subscriptions. Remember that it's free and that you'll just get updates um, and latest videos. Also check down the description, you'll find tons of other educational video content creators who will just uh, shake your socks and turn your head. Um, you wanna do that right now, subscribe to those good folks and support the work that's going out on YouTube so we can teach the world to sing. Yeah. All right guys, that's it, see you later.